Back and we're once again still with uh, Louise and Paul. Before the, the break, we're talking about some of the different aspects that's happening out there with the climate. The Hopi Indians, I just love some of the sayings of the Hopi Indians, and they have a saying that um, when they, they think of making a decision, they think of five generations ahead, which is something we don't do. What is the... Um, what, how does Greenpeace feel about, say, the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years on this planet? What do you think is going to be happening in the way that we're currently approaching climate change? I mean, are, are we starting to come together and, and, and being united and making a difference? What's, what's the mood out there? Well, I think there was um, tremendous elation at the ratification of Kyoto uh, by Kevin Rudd and, and the symbolism of it being his uh, first... Uh, governmental action. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment there's the conference in Bali um, which is planning for the negotiations for the post-Kyoto period which is after 2012. Um, I'd say to you that up until really the, the screening of an inconvenient truth in Australia mm -hmm. there was almost despair at the failure to recognise the realities of climate change and, and and how it will affect future generations. Even our, even you know, people like myself. I'm, I'm. There's a, an ad about a fellow, and he's old, and he's saying it might, might not affect me, but it will definitely affect my children, and absolutely it will affect my grandchildren. And that matters to me, that that we leave the world at least as good a place as we found it. So Greenpeace's a lot of the Greenpeace's activities are about having a sustainable planet. And you can't have a sustainable planet by wiping out 20 to 30 percent of the species through climate change. That is not a sustainable planet. Um, the interlinkage that's recognised now, really well recognised now, between the deforestation uh, that's taking place in developing in a number of developing countries and with, and has been taking place in Australia, although perhaps a little less recently with some of the land clearing uh, laws. Um, but the linkages of that, that we can't just destroy the forests and not expect it to have impacts. Maybe the impacts won't be immediate, but they certainly, through the climate change, uh, we've certainly seen that those impacts are going to have lasting effects and that we, and that, that we have to be more sustainable. Um, in the oceans, we're looking at the potential for collapse of the uh, it yellow, fin and blue-eyed tunas. Mm. Get those colours mixed up. Um, but particularly in the Western Pacific area, um, there are uh, meetings going on at the, at the moment where Greenpeace is uh, present, uh, which are, are looking at the, sustainable, the, the, the fact that the current rate of fishing in the Western Pacific is just not sustainable. And uh, Greenpeace has been campaigning for marine reserves. We're seeing marine reserves coming into effect in, in um, Onshore, onshore areas or close to shore areas, um, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and things like that. And we've seen lots of national parks on land and we've realised the importance of having national parks and, and conservation on land. But one of the things that Greenpeace is drawing people's attention to is that there are no really major national parks in the oceans. And trying to establish, one of our goals is to establish substantial marine reserves, uh, particularly around things like um, seamounts, which are where mountains which don't quite make it to the, to the surface to become islands, but they provide a really rich habitat for fish and breeding. And by protecting those areas, you actually have sustainable fishing and the populations that build in those areas move and as fish are allowed to grow older, their rates of reproduction increase, and, mm. and so there are actually very positive benefits. There may be an initial cost yep. in terms of lower take in some areas, but overall the, the final outcome is actually one which is for the benefit of all of us. Yeah, so in the future. Uh, Louise, how did Greenpeace start? It's, I mean, it's a charity organisation, yep. so you know, where did it start and why? So Greenpeace initially started in, in Canada, yep. or the US, and there was nuclear testing going on in, in the ocean, and a group of individuals decided that they wanted to take direct action to, to stop it. Mm -hmm. So they got themselves a boat together and went out onto the ocean and, and stood in the path of, of where the nuclear testing was going on, and that was 
the, yeah, the beginning of Greenpeace. And when was that roughly? Was that in the 1970s? 70s. Yeah. 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 And how big is Greenpeace globally now? How many countries is it in? How many volunteers? You know, what's the size of this amazing well, organisation? Greenpeace is present in over 40 countries. Mm -hmm. Where we have offices on all continents other than Antarctica and Africa, and um, we we have, for example, in Australia, uh, we have about 85,000 people who financially support Greenpeace, which is uh, uh, quite an incredible amount of support. And in, and in addition to them, are of course, the people who are supportive of our goals and and uh, co-campaign with us uh, and work towards the same goals. But uh, there's 85,000 people who are making regular donations to us. Do you get government funding? No, it's uh, very important that people understand Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. Greenpeace does not accept any uh, grants yep. or donations from government or corporations. Um, what that means is that we have to have fundraising, mm -hmm. so we're very dependent on individuals to fund the work that we do and bequests. But what it means is that when Greenpeace talks, you can be sure that we're not thinking, oh, we better not campaign on that because someone might cut off a donation yeah. next year. So we, we have this incredible advantage over many other groups in that not being dependent on corporate or government funding, we, we can actually speak with an independent voice. And that is a wonderful strength of Greenpeace. You know, it's interesting. Our, our guest last week was Robert Rabin, who was talking about uh, real-time speaking. And he was talking about speaking the truth, speaking from the heart, speaking from choice. And it sounds like Greenpeace is absolutely coming from that being able to be totally responsible for themselves because there's not a big brother whispering in the ear. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true and I think we mentioned earlier the, this um, concept which I believe came from the Society of Friends, the Quakers, uh, of bearing witness mm -hmm. and um, that's one of Greenpeace's strengths is that it's able to bear witness and through the support that we have from individuals all around Australia and in the other countries around the world where we campaign, we have this wonderful strength to be able to do something in the remote highlands of Papua New Guinea to, to preserve forest, but also to help the community to perhaps engage in an eco-timber project, to mark out their land, to establish a conservation plan for it, and at the same time to be campaigning here in Australia against the importation of illegally logged timber and at the same time, in maybe in Germany, to be uh, lobbying a hardware store like a you know, Bunnings or its equivalent, not to stock imported uh, illegally logged timbers, uh, you know, that, where there's no certification as to its origin, and also at the same time in Great Britain on Marble Arch to be mounting a protest against the British government contractors for renovations using illegally logged timbers. So one of the great strengths that Greenpeace has is to be able to take an issue and follow it from the remotest part of Papua New Guinea through to Marble Arch in the United Kingdom and follow the, the whole global chain of that, of that timber from, from where it's sourced all the way through to the markets across a number of different countries through the processing probably in, generally in China mm -hmm. um, and through to the final end users not only in Europe but also here in Australia. So that's, that's an incredible capacity and we see that particularly with the Wales campaign which is um, you might be aware that the whaling fleet has left, left Japan. They've given us the slip, but we'll yep. find them. We always find them. We've never failed to find them. Can we say it's December 2007 we're, we're recording this, yeah? Um, so Greenpeace all around the world has been able to make people aware of the, the lack of any real scientific basis for the so-called scientific research program conducted um, we, we able, are able to lobby in Japan because we have a Greenpeace office in Japan to make people aware of what, what actually happens with the whaling. So how's it going there? I mean, how many people do you have in that office? We've, I, can't tell you the, I can't tell you the exact number of uh, people in the office, Robin, but I can tell you we had um, a young Japanese lady uh, out here who was one of the whales campaigners not so long ago. Um, and we, we had a, a really great video. Um, it was called uh, Whale Love. And that was, um, I think, I can't remember the nationalities of the people, but they did a tour of Japan and they were, were talking to people who'd been, whose families might have been, or communities that might have been involved in whaling, or talking to people about whether they actually ate whale meat. Or, and so that it, it's, we're gradually 
working our way into the consciousness of, of the ordinary Japanese population. For a long period of time we focused on trying to take the message to the Japanese government mm. and what we found is that for whatever reason that hasn't been as successful as we would have liked yeah. and so we're trying to take the message more directly to the Japanese people. It is about power to the people, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. Yep.